tourist town becomes a death trap for three vacationing women. Investigators must link the suspect to the crime scene or their case will be dead in the water. During her abduction, a woman is shot on videotape. Can the blurry image help detectives zoom in on her killer? A murder case rests on two computer disks that have been cut to ribbons. Now, investigators must invent a way to assemble their evidence bit by bit. Every phone call can be followed. Every transaction leaves a trace. Most of us never give it a second thought. But when a crime occurs, technology becomes an electronic witness. into the depths of a mystery. At 9.30 in the morning, boaters discovered a body floating in Tampa Bay. Its hands were tied behind its back. Duct tape covered the nose and mouth. The victim was naked from the waist down. The Coast Guard arrived to recover the body. They cut it free of a weight that dangled below the surface. The victim was female. As they carried her to shore, another call came in. A second body had surfaced seven miles away. Like the first, she was bound and apparently raped. She was also thrown in alive. It was clearly a victim of the same killer. St. Petersburg detective Sindra Cummings worked the case. This body, the second one, also had a yellow nylon rope tied around her neck. It was another female nude from the waist down. The end of the rope around her neck was tied to a two-cell cement block. Her feet were tied together. Her hands were tied at one point, but we believe she struggled and she was able to get her hands free in the water before she died. The killer hadn't finished. No sooner had the second body been recovered than a third victim surfaced 200 yards away, killed in the same manner. The triple homicide in the water sent out ripples of activity. Police boats scoured Tampa Bay for more victims. Divers descended to the bottom. But no more bodies were found. That was the good news. The bad news was that the killer left no immediate clues. He was still out there, somewhere. Whoever killed these women had to be some kind of a monster. The autopsy revealed the three women had been dead between two and three days, giving their killer ample time to flee. Each died from lack of oxygen, either from the tape across their noses and mouths, the rope around their necks, or by drowning. The horror of the crime was compounded by the anonymity of the victims. In a tourist spot like Tampa, people come and go every day. The victims could have come from anywhere. The case was heavily publicized, hoping that someone who knew the victims would come forward. Hundreds of leads poured in. 60 detectives were assigned to follow up. Not one lead panned out. Meanwhile, 1,100 miles away in Van Wert County, Ohio, a dairy farmer named Hal Rogers grew anxious. 
His wife, Joe, and daughters, Michelle you know, and Christy, really were vacationing in Florida. But I wish Dad could come. It was their first time off the farm. You know someone's got to stay the girls had never been to the ocean before and were very excited. But Hal couldn't escape his obligations at the farm and had to send his family without him. Their last postcard was dated 11 days earlier and they hadn't called in a week. He knew something was wrong. While Hal Rogers contemplated a trip to Florida to look for his family, a maid at a Tampa hotel had suspicions of her own. For seven days, she returned to the same room to clean it, but found that the occupants hadn't slept in the beds or even opened a bar of soap. I never saw anybody. Nobody at all. No. The publicity surrounding the murdered women was um, fresh in her mind. Wondering if there were a connection, she told her manager about the room. He notified the police. The room was registered to Joe Rogers. She had arrived with two children. Forensics dusted for fingerprints. One set was positively identified as one of the murder victims. Identification was difficult because the bodies were so decomposed when found. But investigators at last had something to work with. On the hotel registration, Rogers had listed her vehicle. The car wasn't in the parking lot. Tampa police spread out to locate it. They found it parked at a boat ramp two and a half miles from the hotel. Forensics combed every inch of it for clues. they found a tourist brochure. On the back were handwritten directions to their hotel. The penmanship was compared against Joe's, Christie's, and Michelle's. It didn't match. It was apparently written by someone they met on the road. To investigators, this meant only that they became lost and asked someone for directions. It was hardly a lead. A tourist's life is full of such brief interactions with strangers. That's precisely why investigators were so troubled by this case. The killer, too, was no doubt a stranger to the victims, and crimes committed by strangers are the hardest to solve because nothing connects victim to killer. It could be anyone from the entire Tampa Bay population that we were concerned about and it had everyone in Tampa Bay area concerned and worried because the victims were, were just tourists, someone that everyone can identify with. Uh, they weren't in a drug area, they weren't doing anything illegal or anything wrong, and here they, they were singled out and victimized by an unknown person, and we had no leads to the suspect, nothing to start with. Investigators also found a sheet of hotel stationery with directions to the boat ramp. They included the words, blue with white. Because the directions were to the boat ramp and the women were killed on the water, detectives assumed the words described the killer's boat. It also described hundreds of other boats in Tampa Bay. Investigators determined that the handwriting on the stationery matched Joe Rogers. The killer must have visited or phoned her at the hotel and dictated them. But no one had seen him, and the hotel didn't keep a log of incoming calls. The ferocity of the crime told police that the killer probably had a prior record. More than likely, he worked his way up to murder through a series of smaller crimes. But without further leads, the investigation stagnated. Months rolled by as waves of suspects arose and were eliminated. In October, four months after the murders, investigators received a bulletin about a rape that occurred on a boat at Madeira Beach two weeks before the Rogers were killed. The victim was a tourist. Madeira Beach was only 10 miles from the murder scene. Sergeant Glenn Moore says the similarities between this case and the Rogers rape and murder didn't stop there. 
the suspect in the Madeira Beach case had threatened to uh, use duct tape on the mouth of one of the of the victim on the Madeira Beach rape case and uh, that was what was used on our victims. Uh, he also threatened the, uh, this woman with uh, dying. Was it worth dying for? And um, he also had a blue and white boat. The victim gave police a description of the rapist. His eyes were sunken, very sunken. Besides his blue and white boat, she also remembered that her attacker drove a dark four-wheel drive vehicle with tinted windows. The composite of her attacker's face was published in the papers. Yeah. Tips flooded in. Months passed as detectives chased every lead that could connect a suspicious stranger to the victims. It came to nothing. By now, almost a year had passed, and all they had was a picture of a rapist who may or may not be the killer. Without any promising leads in the Tampa Bay triple homicide, Sergeant Glenn Moore reviewed the evidence collected so far. He had a composite sketch with no ID and a brochure with directions to the hotel written in a stranger's hand. The brochure was taken to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement lab in Tampa and processed to reveal fingerprints. It held some prints that didn't belong to any of the victims. They were analyzed by latent print examiner Sam McMullen. There's what we call or refer to sometimes as writer's palm. And that's when you're writing a document the way that your hand, the palm of your hand falls on the document itself. A palm print is just as conclusive as a fingerprint in making an ID. Whoever left these prints wrote the directions on the brochure. Now, detectives wondered if this same person possibly killed the Rogers. If this writer were the killer, his fingerprints were probably on file for prior offenses. Although palm prints become part of a repeat offender's record, they aren't usually cataloged in the computerized fingerprint system. Investigators had no way of doing an automated search. All they could do was manually compare the print against each new suspect that surfaced. More time slipped by without a match. The prints and the writing sample seemed useless. Moore wouldn't let the investigation die. The man who killed the Rogers was at large, and police were determined to find him. To flush him out, they held press conferences, posted billboards. And typically what happens is, is you put up a picture of the victims and you say, does anybody know anything about this case? I think what was a little bit different and unique about what we did with the billboards was is we actually put a picture of, of the handwriting evidence up on the billboard and asked people to look at that and tell us if they knew the, who the handwriter was. Among the deluge of leads, one stood out. A woman named Joanne Steffi told police that the handwriting looked like a former neighbor's, an aluminum siding contractor named Oba Chandler. She had seen the composite when it first appeared and thought it resembled Chandler. But she wasn't sure. The handwriting rekindled her suspicions. When we uh, put the handwriting up on the billboards and uh, it brought it back to her attention, she went and checked with some other neighbors and some other people and found some contracts for the business he was in. She made the visual comparison herself along with her neighbors and they decided it was a great likelihood this was the writer, so they gave us a call. The contracts and brochure were sent to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement where they were scrutinized by document examiner Teresa Stubbs. The examination of handwriting is really a study of movement. You're looking at all the aspects of the writing, the beginning uh, strokes 
the ending strokes, the height relationships of letters to other letters. Once I had familiarized myself with all those habits that were on the brochure, then I compared them with the habits found in the known sample of writing submitted as being that of Mr. Chandler. I found that they were significantly similar in all aspects with no differences. The handwriting match was the break the detectives needed. A little more digging and investigators found that 45-year-old Oba Chandler had a long criminal record, having been charged with everything from burglary and counterfeiting to kidnapping. Police obtained his palm prints from his prison records. The print found on the brochure matched Oba Chandler's right hand. They had their suspect. Now they had to build their case. And how are you? Detectives arranged a photo lineup suspect with the Madera Beach rape victim, asking if she could identify the man who attacked her. In these particular photographs. She selected Oba Chandler's picture. More confident than ever that Chandler was the murderer, Sergeant Moore kept him under surveillance to see if he would tip his hand. He didn't. And they didn't have enough to arrest him. To prove he killed the Rogers, they had to place him at the scene of the crime. The waters of Tampa Bay held no clues. But maybe the answer was in the air. Detectives sought his phone records to see if they could trace his whereabouts. Chandler's phone records showed that on the night of the murders, June 1, 1989, five calls were made between 1.30 and 5 a.m. The prefixes showed that these calls were shipped to shore, made collect to his home. They were extremely important. They put Oba Chandler on his boat the night of the killings the night that the women were murdered and thrown into the bay, we could prove that Oba Chandler was on his boat. At his trial, Chandler said he'd been fishing on the bay that night when his engine failed. He told the jury that his fuel line broke, and by the time he fixed it with duct tape, he'd lost all his gas. He was stranded until a passing boat rescued him the next morning. But the jury didn't buy his fish story. On cross-examination, Chandler couldn't explain why he called home, but didn't call a towing service. He couldn't describe where the fuel line enters the engine. He didn't realize that duct tape doesn't stick to a gas-covered fuel line. And most importantly, he didn't know his engine had an anti-siphon valve, making it impossible for the gas to leak out if the line burst. I believe that was one of the defining moments for the jury to see him on the stand and to see all of what he said proven wrong. The prosecution presented a more credible scenario. Excuse me, sir. Do you know how to get to the Viking Hotel? Yeah, which one? Lost in Tampa, Joe Rogers and her daughters stopped to ask directions to their hotel. The friendly stranger who showed them the way was Oba Chandler. Now he knew where they were staying. He may have called them shortly after they checked in, inviting them to watch the setting sun from aboard his boat. Joe jotted down the directions, and off they went. There was no time to unpack. When they arrived at the pier, Chandler was there to greet them. They boarded the boat never suspecting this was to be their last sunset. For his crimes, Oba Chandler was sentenced to death. Oba Chandler didn't care who he killed. Most murderers are more selective. The road to their conviction begins with a motive. In Northumberland County in central Pennsylvania, a young girl returned home from her grandparents' house. 
She'd walked this path dozens of times, and her mind was a million miles away. But on June 12, 1989, the foul smell of decay caught her attention. She cautiously investigated, hoping it wasn't a dog struck by a car. What she found was far worse, a human body. How long ago? Pennsylvania State Police rushed in to document the scene before the body was transported to the morgue for autopsy. Every homicide investigation begins with three questions. Who's the victim? When did the murder take place? And who did it? District Attorney Robert Sakavage, now a district judge, searched for answers. We could not get a quick identification. We had to use scientific techniques. We had to get a forensic odontologist to examine uh, the teeth and so forth uh, for that purpose. Also, we were interested in finding what the time of death was. The warm weather had taken its toll. There wasn't much left to collect. All that the police could tell was that the victim was female. She didn't easily surrender information about her death. Her clothing provided the first clue. County Coroner Richard Ulrich analyzed the remains. The clothing was removed, and upon being removed, was displayed and was examined further. And at this point in time, it was felt that she uh, suffered repeated stab wounds uh, to the back through the clothing, which indicated uh, blunt force sharp injury. Next, the insect life colonizing the body was examined. The life cycles of flies and beetles can be used to estimate the time of death. The longer a body sits, the more generations of insects it nourishes. It was determined that the victim was killed between 19 and 25 days earlier. The dental records identified the victim as Lori Ocker, who had disappeared 19 days before, on May 24th. Lori Ocker and her son had moved back in with her parents after separating from her husband. She was last seen leaving home at 3.30 for her job at a pet store in the mall. By 4 o'clock, she hadn't arrived at work. Her boss phoned her home to see where she was. She left for work. Her mother was concerned. She should have been there already. Thinking her car may have broken down, her parents retraced her route. They saw no sign of her until they arrived at the mall. Her car was parked near the entrance but no trace of Lori was found until her body was recovered 19 days later. For almost three weeks, Lori Ocker was considered a missing person. But now her case was turned over to homicide and attention shifted to finding her killer. Lori's mother told police that Lori had received threats from her estranged husband, Robert Auker. The couple had been battling over custody of their son. Lori had been so afraid of Robert that she kept a shotgun under her bed for protection. He became the prime suspect. Shortly after Lori disappeared, police had questioned Robert Auker. He told investigators that he'd been out running errands in his Plymouth Caravel. He hadn't seen Lori. His parents, questioned later, agreed that he'd been out, but said he'd driven his mother's car, a 1984 Chevy Celebrity. At the time, the inconsistency meant nothing to investigators.
Robert may have been lying because he wasn't covered on the Chevy's insurance. To prove Robert's involvement, they'd have to place him at the scene of the abduction. Police went to the mall to see if anyone had seen anything suspicious. They spoke to a teller at the bank next to the mall entrance. She suggested that perhaps the tape from the automatic teller machine held some clue, since it captured the portion of the parking lot where the victim parked her car. Well, I don't remember seeing it, but... An ATM camera snaps still images onto videotape at preset intervals. The camera at the mall where Ockler disappeared took a picture every 10 seconds. Lori Ocker had been missing five days by the time investigators were able to obtain the tape. The image, fuzzy but undeniable, was Ocker's car. Next to it was a figure assumed to be Ocker. It was the next image, taken 10 seconds later, that caught investigators' attention. Uh, the picture was not clear. The focus of the camera was on a person who was negotiating a, a transaction with the machine. Over his shoulder, deeper into the parking lot, was what we believe a scene of abduction. The image showed a car crossing the victim's path. She's leaning into the car. In the next frame, the car is driving away and Lori is gone. The car, though ghost-like, vaguely resembled the Chevy owned by Robert Auker's mother. Robert Auker was a suspect by virtue of the fact that he and Lori parted on such hostile terms. Lori feared for her life, but it appeared that Robert had managed to lure her into the car. At the time of this abduction, Robert Auker was exercising his first weekend of visitation, and he had in his custody the child. Uh, we absolutely have no statements to that effect, but circumstantially, we know that how devoted she was to that child. Is there any conceivable reason she would have gone into the car? Probably, if somebody would have told her that her, something was wrong with her child or she was needed, she might do it for that reason. Investigators faced two obstacles linking the car to the homicide. First, the image on the ATM was too blurry to conclusively prove it was the Chevrolet. And second, Robert Auker's father had sold the car three days after Lori Auker disappeared. It had changed hands four times in the months since Auker sold it. It was finally traced to its new owner, 90 miles away. Despite the fact that the car had been thoroughly cleaned prior to sale, the forensics team was able to raise clues from the vehicle. In a door gasket were strands of hair consistent with the victims. It had pulp on the end, indicating that it didn't just fall out. The question was why uh, would Lori Auker's hair be there in a car not belonging to Robert Auker, but belonging to the mother? We also had information that uh, she seldom, if ever, was near that vehicle. Clue by clue, the circumstantial evidence was building against Robert Auker. The rear light configuration, this is a much But investigators knew that the case depended on identifying the vehicle on the tape. Without any witnesses, uh, our main witness in the case was the camera itself. Murder is not a spectator sport. You seldom get eyewitnesses to a murder. Investigators tried the next best thing. They reconstructed the crime using the Auker's Chevy. They positioned it in the parking lot to approximate the unknown car, and they taped it with the same camera and focus as the ATM image. Then, the two images were compared. The results were encouraging, 
but inadequate to snuff reasonable doubt. The tape from the ATM wasn't enough. Investigators knew they needed to enhance the image, but in 1989, enhancement technology was in its infancy. They didn't know if it was possible to clean up the video. Sakavage contacted Eastman Kodak for help. They suggested NASA. If anyone on the planet had the ability to turn fuzzy images into hard evidence, it would be the Ballistic Missile Defense Organization at Kennedy Space Center. Principal investigator Alan Teachin is in charge of analyzing images from shuttle launches for evaluation or troubleshooting. When the Pennsylvania State Police contacted him, he knew that enhancing the ATM tape wasn't rocket science, but it was close. The process was very much the same. The source material was different in that videotape from a ATM machine is poorer quality than what we normally deal with. Tietjen knew the quality of the image was too poor to identify faces or the license plate. The best he could hope for was to identify the car model. The image was loaded into a computer, which converted it into a digital image made of dots of light called pixels. 512 pixels per line, 512 lines per image. The process took five days. The computer, governed by a set of mathematical equations, manipulates the pixels, enhancing the picture. There is no human intervention directing a specific result. The mathematics determine the result. Each set of equations produces a different outcome. Tietjen had to be meticulous in his methods. He was setting a precedent. Never before had video enhancement been used in a capital case. He devoted three weeks to enhancing the ATM video. Once he completed it, he set to work enhancing the police reconstruction video. He used the same parameters for both in order to demonstrate that the images were in fact enhanced and not altered. Even with enhancement, the car in the original video wasn't perfectly clear. To make their case, investigators hired an expert from General Motors to identify the make and model of the car. He identified it as a Chevy Celebrity, model year 1983 or 84. Robert Auker's mother drove a 1984 model. Sakavich had placed the Auker's car and Robert Auker at the crime scene. The image enhancement made his case. Based on the forensic evidence and the unambiguously enhanced images, Robert Auker was sentenced to death for the kidnapping and murder of his estranged wife, Lori Auker. The landmark case also established image enhancement as a powerful tool in the crime fighter's arsenal. There are video cameras all around us. So they're capturing images, and whenever anything significant happens, now police are going to those cameras to try and capture some critical evidence. And now they're using digital imaging to try and uh, uh, get it enhanced to a point where it's, it's more reliable than it would have otherwise been. Every murder investigation is like a puzzle. Solving it requires finding the right pieces. But in a case in the Philippines, investigators had the pieces they needed. They just didn't know how to fit them together. In the pre-dawn hours of February 25, 1991, a disabled truck on a desolate road caught the eye of a taxi driver in Angela City, the Philippines. He stopped to assist the driver. realized he had no help to offer. The woman behind the wheel was dead. When police arrived, the key was still in the ignition. The driver was still strapped into her seat. She was an American. Officials at nearby Clark Air Base were notified. Calling Central, calling Central. This is Chief Gindon, uh, 
uh, pwedeng pakidala dito ng, uh, ng mga police para ma-check natin itong babae itong mukhang tigay at Clark Air Base. Eh. Life on the base is tight-knit. The first investigator on the scene thought he recognized the truck and its driver, a master sergeant's wife named Julie Snodgrass. Tim Davis. Office of Special Investigations Regional Forensic Consultant, Lieutenant Colonel Tim Davis, was summoned. As we approached the truck, one of the agents came over and said, um, Sir, I, I, I think it's, it's Julie. Uh, when I walked up to the truck and looked in, uh, I just said, oh my God, and you, um, you, you, you don't forget those kind of things. Mm -hmm. I will tell you that, you just don't. As an Air Force wife, Julie was a friendly face at picnics and parties, which she attended with her husband, Joe, and sometimes their two young children. She was, she was a good gal to be around, friendly, I never knew an enemy. Um, that's what I had a problem with when I was at the scene, was that I'd just seen Julie two days before, and I'd ask her, hey, I told her she looked great. Um, she's got this great glow in her eyes, this great smile, and um, it, it's tough. The glove box had been ransacked. Its contents spilled across the seat and onto the floor. Superficially, it looked like a robbery, but it was too violent for that. The victim had been stabbed more than 40 times. This was an act of violence. This wasn't an act of, hey, lady, give me your purse. Um, uh, I'm gonna steal your truck. It, it wasn't anything like that. This, this was an act that was done clearly to kill Julie. The truck was carefully transported to a garage at the base where it was swabbed for blood that might belong to the killer. Hair and fibers were also collected. The sample were sent to the Army Crime Lab at Camp Zama, Japan. The results were disappointing. None of the blood, fibers, or hair found in the car pointed to anyone other than the victim. Investigators hoped that more significant clues were still to be found. The truck was carefully enclosed in a tent and fumed with superglue vapor, which exposes latent fingerprints. Some partial prints were lifted from the dashboard. They didn't belong to Julie or Joe Snodgrass, but the Philippines had no system to match fingerprints with known felons. It was another dead end. Besides the brutality of the crime, one question kept nagging at Davis. What was the victim doing in that part of town, especially at that hour? If Julie went somewhere, generally it was on base only. Very rarely did Julie ever go off base. The victim's husband, Joe Snodgrass, was questioned about the night of the murder. It was an awkward situation. Joe was in charge of managing all the evidence collected from crimes involving Air Force personnel in the Philippines. Because of his personal connection, the murder of his wife was one case he was not cataloging. I'd like to ask you a couple of questions. Where were Snodgrass you? told investigators that he and Julie argued. She stormed uh, out. Well, that day I was out he called several of her wife. friends to see if they'd seen or heard from her. He even kept a log of the calls he'd made. That level of attention to detail raised suspicions. <laughs> if you're watching and you believe in, uh, in the TV cop stuff, uh, primarily one of the things that a guilty person does is keep a log of the phone calls. So you, you just think, oh, come on, this is, this is too obvious here. <laughs> but, he, but he actually did. <laughs> Joe and Julie Snodgrass had a history of domestic problems. In fact, a year earlier, 
Julie had divorced Joe and moved back to the States with their children. Joe had convinced her to come back to him one month before her death. Okay, uh, what kind of job do you do? To see if their relationship was souring once again, investigators spoke to their housekeeper. And I take care of the children. She was nervous and unable to offer any information about the Snodgrass's relationship. Where you at? Considering her daily interactions with the family, that seemed strange. Investigators had no evidence to justify their suspicions about Joe Snodgrass. Then, the housekeeper decided to come clean. So, uh, Lucy, uh, what did you do? Just you as go? the investigation into the murder of Julie Snodgrass was hitting a wall, the timid young housekeeper broke the case open. She admitted that, uh, to having an affair with Joe Snodgrass. More than that, she told investigators that he had written her a letter asking her to hire her relatives to kill Julie Snodgrass. He asked me to find somebody to kill her. He wanted me to find She destroyed it. But her word was enough to get a warrant to search did you, Joe's office. Did you get to find your relative? What? Investigators confiscated some handwritten letters and computer floppy disks from his office. This is some, yeah. Okay. Then, as a matter of legal procedure, Snodgrass was called in to identify the items collected in order to establish ownership. When presented with the floppy disks, Snodgrass suddenly lunged forward and pulled something out of his pocket. We heard one of the agents call out he has a weapon, and at that time, uh, a number of agents who were armed ran by us and ran to the interview room. And then it was determined at that point that Joe had a pair of scissors. Snodgrass had concealed a pair of pinking shears. He had grabbed the disc all in basically one, one motion. This was like flash second stuff. And Joe began to cut the disc up into pieces. This is, this is evidence. Um, this is not supposed to happen, uh, but it did. Yes. The disks obviously contain something incriminating. That stuff. Could their data be salvaged? Uh, Davis wasn't hopeful. I mean, you've taken something that was intact, and now it's in 20-some pieces. And in your mind, it's there, 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 in a sense, becomes 23 more pieces of evidence. How do, how do you deal with it? That was the question of the hour. No one had ever dealt with anything quite like it before. He sent the fragments to the Department of Defense Computer Forensics Laboratory in Washington, D.C. They became the responsibility of Special Agent Jim Christie, of the Air Force Office of Special Investigations. From the time I got the initial phone call from the Philippines, we, were, we had all our computer crime investigators out trying to find uh, uh, someone who had a technique to recover the data, because uh, no one uh, uh, had ever tried that before. You're going to like this. Oh, that's beautiful. So it's just from the Philippines. Back. Not only were the disks cut up, okay. each piece was crumpled minutes. as well. Cool. No problem. Christie shopped the disks to private companies, to other law enforcement agencies, to the FBI. Each politely declined, saying the task was impossible or staggeringly expensive. So when my deputy, Ed Cutchins, and I, we drove around the Beltway, picked up our disks, and we're driving back around the Beltway, and coming back to the headquarters here, and uh, uh, Ed said, OK, you've let everybody else have a shot at this. You're going to let me have a shot. And I said, what are you going to do? He says, well, I'm going to scotch tape them back together. And I won't tell you what I, I told him at that point. They experimented with blank formatted disks, cutting them, taping them back together, and slipping them into a drive to see if the data were still readable. The first attempt was disappointing. So we turned it on. And I watched my disk drive 
bounce across the table for about 10-15 seconds till the read write heads ripped off. Before they tried again, investigators placed a second floppy underneath the taped floppy to cover up the seams. They saw their first glimmer of progress. The disk drive survived. But before they could apply the technique to the actual disk fragments, they had to flatten them out. Once again, brainstorming and intensive trial and error brought results. A soldering iron placed in a section of aluminum tubing provided the right amount of heat and pressure to flatten the fragile sheet. Once the segments were flattened, investigators had to try to read them. They knew they might only have one chance. So when putting the pieces together, they erred on the side of caution. We're afraid that if we put them all together, that if one piece ripped and caught the head, it might tear up the other evidence. So we decided to create host diskettes, what we called host diskettes for each piece. Each fragment was spliced onto its own separate host diskette and read individually. 23 fragments, 23 host diskettes. One chance to catch a killer. Computer forensics experts in Washington, D.C. puzzled over how to assemble the pieces of the mutilated diskettes in order to solve a murder. Some of the fragments were so small, investigators didn't know how to align them on the disk. These more troublesome pieces were sprayed with a solution called Magna C. The magnetic spray dries to a powder and reveals the magnetic tracks on the disk fragments. Once the fragment was properly aligned on the host diskette, the powder was brushed away. Finally, it came time to read the fragments. To analyze and display the bits and pieces of data, investigators relied on a software package called Anadisk, developed for law enforcement. Anadisk kept a trail of the separate segments of data and displayed them on the screen so they could be combined the pieces, in more ways than one, were falling into place. But the splices still caused problems. Information on a diskette is tightly packed. Whenever the disk drive head hit a splice, it lost contact with the disk and missed large chunks of data. For this high-tech problem, an assistant supplied a low-tech solution. Well, what he did was he just put his finger on the head, just like you would put a... Uh... Uh, a, a penny or a, a coin on, a, on an old photograph when you, if you got stuck. And, and by putting his finger on it and rereading that sector, the head didn't bounce and we were able to get more data. Investigators found love letters Snodgrass wrote to his wife and to his mistress, along with letters to his insurance company requesting an increase in Julie Snodgrass's coverage. They also recovered information linking Joe to an elaborate black market scheme. But what they found next was akin to a signed confession. Uh, we found a last paragraph of a letter uh, talking about his girlfriend hiring the hitman, him asking his uh, uh, girlfriend to hire hitmen, which she did. It had taken five weeks, but the DOD forensics lab had achieved what was thought to be impossible. They had resurrected data that enabled a brutal murder to be avenged, and in the process, developed a set of procedures for others to follow. Experts said the cost could reach into the millions. They spent $131. The information they gathered was sent back to Lieutenant Colonel Davis in the Philippines. I'll tell you flat out, had we probably not had that, we'd have had a tougher case to prove. But with the, the, the documentation that was recovered from that disc, there was no mistake. We had Joe. Investigators reconstructed the likely Joey. course of events that led up to the murder. Yeah. Okay. Joe Snodgrass, who was very <laughs> controlling of his wife, had convinced her to deliver some money he owed to one of his black market contacts. 
He told her to pick up two of his Confederates and to drive them to the drop-off point. She complied. She didn't know that the men she picked up were the ones hired to murder her. They were the relatives of the Snodgrass's housekeeper. Trusting them, she drove to a secluded spot. Then they killed her. Phyllis, can you tell us what happened that night? Uh, I didn't sort sir. They confessed to the crime and received 20 years. The housekeeper received probation. I'll do it this last time, but not anymore. And for masterminding the crime, Joe Snodgrass received life in prison. You, you never stop and think that you would end up investigating one of your own for murder or being involved in the conspiracy to commit murder. It, it never crosses your mind, ne not once. The technology that simplifies our lives has also made it harder for us to pass unnoticed. In almost everything we do, we leave behind an electronic trail as solid as footprints and as individual as our own face. When a crime occurs unseen by human eyes, investigators can invoke an electronic witness.